Our scripture reading today is from Nehemiah chapter 1. I'm reading from the NIV. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hapaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Ananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servants praying before you day and night for, for your servant, the people of Israel. I confess the sins of Israelites, of, of we, as, <coughs> we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, that even if you were, your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. God bless the reading of the word. I do not have COVID, I have allergies, okay? <laughs> You're sitting out there going, oh, he's contagious. I am not, I promise. Um, I just have, and since 2020, it's been, uh, I have to say that a lot. So welcome, I, I thank you for, uh, for allowing me to come in. Uh, good morning, what, whatever I should say to you right now to, to, to let you know, I am excited to be here. I'm looking forward to, to speaking this morning. Uh, I do come from Cornelia Camp. Uh, according to my GPS, it was 19 minutes to get here this morning. Uh, we're just a little uh, south and, and west of here. We sit right on the, the Lake County and Ashley County line. We have about 320 acres. Uh, we're up to 17 saddle animals and four miniature horses. We do horseback riding, paintball, high, uh, low ropes, creek hikes, pool, fishing, canoeing, archery, tomahawk throwing, whew, all kinds of stuff out there at camp that we do. And all of those are a means to our message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, risen again. And so that's that's kind of who, where I come from. I've been there for about 20, uh, just over 20 years. Yesterday was my 20-year uh, anniversary. And so with all of that said, um, I'm wondering if you are like me at all, because if I were sitting where you're sitting right now, um, what I would be thinking is, why in the world should I listen to this guy? You know, are you going to be thinking that right now? I'm going to be honest. No, nope, no. Nope. Well, I, I would be thinking that, and it's a legit question. <laughs> at least I, I think it's a legit question to say, why should you listen to somebody that just comes in and stands up in front of you, other than, other than Ed's blessing, and Ed is a good man. And so, other than that, um, and forgive me, I have been struggling with, uh, um, if you guys know, it's macular degeneration. And so this is all, uh, all a new learning experience for me as my eyes have, have uh, turned on me in the last year. And so my font is 36 and I still struggle to see a little bit. So with that said, why should you, why should you, you be listening to me? Anyway. <laughs> Now we are going to wing it today because not all of my notes are printed. They're all here. So here, why should you listen to me? First off, I've been doing this for about 41 years. I've been working with children and youth and young adults in, in children's ministry, in camp ministry, in, in, in all, all different types of young adult ministry. And everything I'm going to say today comes out of, of that experience. Uh, number two, <laughs> you've already committed to being in the pew 
Uh, and so you might as well you might as well pay attention a little bit. And if and, and here, if you choose to, to not listen to me today, uh, at least listen to the word of God. At least listen to what He has to to say to us this morning, um, as as it's more important than anything I could ever say. Um, and then finally, the last reason I can tell you to to listen to me is simply this. Uh, I've been known to throw things at people who fall asleep at camp. So be careful. I'm just kidding. You know, I, I have this, this thought that if we laugh together in life, uh, life is a lot easier to live together. And so if I say bad puns or bad jokes today, it's not canned food drive, right? So we're okay then. Um, so if you will, I've got to, I've got to change my, my, my thinking here for just a minute. I apologize. Um, what's really crazy, I know right where I left those... Those notes, they're sitting in my, at my house. Um, they're sitting in my house uh, on my desk because I was reading them this morning. And I should not have done that. I was ready before I ever, ever came up. But I thought, oh, I'll read them one more time to be ready. If you will, let me find the scripture. We're going to get to, uh, you know what? You, you want, you want, yeah, you want a bigger font? Yeah, you have a bigger font. <laughs> That'd be a wonderful thing. <laughs> oh my goodness <sighs> Lord you are in total control and we give you glory in all things in Jesus name, amen oh oh there we go and even opened up to Nehemiah for me that's even better alright, so we, we pick up the story, let me give you a little a little background as we, as we pick up the story of Nehemiah <coughs> <laughs> Forgive me. Um, let me pick up this this background of, of Nehemiah. First off, um, Nehemiah it, it begins begins this book. Uh, sorry, the whole need for the wall to be rebuilt. All of this starts way back when Solomon was was king. And Solomon, you know, he he married uh, inner inner state, inner worlds, or inner inner countries, and he, he married not just in his own people, and he married to make connections. If you will, he married for networking. And he married, so that, and what happened is um, the, the women he married brought in their idols, their gods, their wooden gods, their stone gods, their iron gods, their metal gods. They brought them in, and the people begin to turn and, and go away from the one true God, his, the Israelites. And so what happens there? God says, if you turn from me, we will, we will, and you'll be exiled. <laughs> and sure enough, they're exiled, and they're gone, and, and the people fall away. And so we're picking up Nehemiah, and it's actually the return has started. If you don't know this, uh, Zerubbabel first brings back a group of people to Jerusalem. And he brings them back, and they begin to rebuild the temple. All right? And they rebuild the temple, and, 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 it, and you go through all kinds of hardships and difficulties, but it's getting done. And then a little later, uh, by the way, they were exiled in three waves, and they're brought back in three waves. Um, a little bit later, Ezra comes back. And Ezra brings some people with him, and he calls the people back to their covenant obligations, back to God. He calls them back. And he's saying, hey, let's get back to the covenant. Let's get back to who God has called us to be, what God has called us to do, how let's live up to. And now we pick up Nehemiah. We pick up this, 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 this guy, and he's, he, he called, he's called to rebuild the wall. And in fact, he does. And he also calls the people to come back to their faithfulness again, too. But that's where we're at. That's what we're finding out. <laughs> All right. And as we open open the book up in, 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 chapter, in chapter one, we're beginning to see what happens. And I just have to say to you, look out! Because that's what Nehemiah does. That's how this all begins. So Nehemiah in, in chapter one, you know what? Where's my reader? Would you please stand up and I ask you, would you just read the verse? That'll save me for, again, this is my fault. That fault I'm going to struggle with. Read, read verse 1, would you? Okay, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hathaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. All right, so what we find here is that, that Nehemiah is in his daily life, daily grind. This is all about finding our purpose, our passion, what God has called us to do. Um, and and, and that, I believe that's what happens here with Nehemiah. I think that's what we see in this first chapter is Nehemiah 
begins to see his true purpose, his true calling, if you will. Uh, you know, and, now, and if you're like me, my goal is to, to do what God called me to do. My goal is to do what God asks me to do. So if you will, to, to fulfill my purpose. I told you I've been doing this for about 41 years with kids and youth and young adults. And, and, and what I find is that, that those kids, those youth, those young adults, and to be honest with you, I think even all adults, when we find our purpose, when we find what we're called to, when we're doing what God asks us to do, wants us to do, when that's going on, we, we, are, we, we are more likely to have a satisfied life, if you will. We live in a world that, that, that is crazy. And I watch so many people who struggle day in and day out to live, live lives productively. Um, and and they, they struggle with finding their purpose and their place in life. And so, but when we do, when I see kids who do this, when they find what they're, they're supposed to be doing, then they're like, even though it might be difficult, it's an easier life for them to live. If you remember in John uh, chapter 5, Jesus actually describes it like this. He says, I can only do what I see the Father do. Jesus said, I'm going to do what, what, what I see him, what he gives me, that's what I'm going to do. And so this morning, as we, we look at Nehemiah and we see this first verse, we see that he's in, he's in his daily life. He's in the citadel. He's going through life. By the way, do any of you guys have housework or chores or jobs you have to go to or bills you have to pay? Or, you know, Nehemiah was not put in a little room to look for, to find his purpose. It wasn't that he was, he was stuck aside and he spent all his time in scripture and in prayer. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he had heard of that, but he wasn't there. Uh, what we see is in his, in his daily life, when, when, it's, when the purpose for him actually shows itself to him. All right? And when he, when he sees it. And, and, and so we, we see that he's going about. And, and so just like us, we need to be walking along, doing our daily life. When we're doing our daily life, we have to look out. We have to look out to see what's happening. And if you'll read verse 2. Thank you. Interactive preaching. I love it. Yet and I, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. <clears throat> so look out. Look out and see. You see, uh, Nehemiah didn't have his eyes closed. He wasn't going about, well, this I just got to pay the bills. I just got to do this work. No, when, when he saw his, his brother and other men coming, he had a concern. You see, you, you gotta you gotta know that Nehemiah knew that the, the temple had been rebuilt and, and that the wall had at one point been started to be built, and that the people, some of the people were going back, and he knew that, and he looked out, he looked out from himself and he saw what was going on, and he wanted to know what exactly is happening with my people. You see, too often we spend we spend our lives doing what I call belly button gazing, and, and that's simply that we spend our time looking down and, and trying to figure out. What, what, oh, well, poor me, I've got this. And I worry about, my, oh, how am I going to pay this bill? And how am I going to do this? And what if that, what if this happens? And we spend all of our time looking in, worried about us, and not nearly enough time looking out at what else is going on out there. And Nehemiah's first question to, at least the first question we have, the only question we have, is what's going on with them? What's happening outside? He looks out and he asks, so not verse 3. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Okay. So, so when we ask questions, when Nehemiah asks the question, um, what he finds out is not positive news. It's not good things. You know, the, 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 the walls are down, the Gates are burned. Nothing good is happening. Now, you've got to understand that the wall that was built around was for protection. And when the wall is down, there's no protection. It's also a disgrace to that, that place to not have a wall to be able to protect. And so they, they, they could be looted or, or what, all kinds of things go on. We have the same thing in our lives. You know, sometimes the news we get when we, when we, when we look out, if you will, when we look out, we see what's going on in our communities in our families, in our state, in our nation. When we look out and we see the hurt and the pain, a lot of times it's not good news. 
You know, I, I have a pastor friend who's a pastor at Asheville, <laughs> and, and he tells me often of, of the fact that the, he's downtown and the, the, the drug addicts and the homelessness that is happening right outside of his church. And so when you, you look out quite often, you may not see or, or, or understand or hear or know and what, what's out there if it's, it's may not always be good. It may not always be good. And in fact, it might be that very thing that draws us to our purpose, if you will. All right? In fact, quite often when we begin to see the hurt of others, we begin to understand and, and our calling. And if you would read, uh, I think we're on verse 4 now. Is that right? When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. <laughs> we're, I found my notes. We're, we're at the right place now. I start preaching now. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. When, when we hear this hurt and we hear this pain, when we look out, if you will, and see what's going on in the world, especially the world nearest us, when we see that happening, we can't be ostriches. We can't stick our head in the sand. We can't deny that it's there. We can't avoid that it's there. We have to honestly look at and see what's going on and then we have to react to it. And what, what does Nehemiah do? What does it say Nehemiah does? It says, when, when, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. When we look out, when, when we really want to know what God has called us to do, when we want to do what he's asking us to do, and we look out to see what's out there, and we begin to, to notice and understand the pain that's there, then, then we, we need to be broken. Our hearts need to be broken for what breaks God's heart. God's people were, were in disarray. His, 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 his city was, was ready to be destroyed. The, the walls were gone. The temple, while rebuilt, was not what it was. It, didn't, it never reached its former glory. And it broke Nehemiah's heart. When we look out and we see teenagers who are struggling with uh, unwed mothers who are struggling, when we see families who are being destroyed, when we see those who are, are addicted and, and, and hooked on, on drugs and alcohol and heroin and, and, and we see homeless and we see the pain and the hurt that is all around us, we can't be ostriches. We can't avoid it. We are called. We are called by God to be reaching out to a hurting and needy world. Our purpose is part of that. And how does he, how does he make that? How do we do that? <clears throat> Morning weeping, praying. It says Nehemiah did this for several days. It wasn't, it's never convenient. Um, when we go to find our purpose, when we see the hurt of others, when we see the, the, the pain and it breaks us and, and, and we allow our hearts to actually to be broken over what breaks God's heart, it's never convenient. It's never in our timing. You know, it, it, it takes up our effort. It takes up our time to be there, to understand. It says Nehemiah prayed and he mourned and he wept and he did it for days as he heard and he saw this going on. <clears throat> uh, it is at this point of brokenness that we often find our, our purpose. Our reason for doing, our reason for being, what Christ has called us to do to a hurting and needy world. When we look out and we see and we feel the pain of others is when we are most, um, most open to finding God's purpose in our lives. You know, in, in Lake County, there is a, there's a ministry going on and it's been... Uh, I, don't know, I can't tell you how many years now. Um, it, it's called Sub Zero. 
Have any of you guys heard of it? And, and Sub Zero, uh, Sub Zero collects uh, winter clothes and hats and gloves and coats and blankets, and they make sure that the homeless, the homeless have those the, the, those needs met as best they can. And then they have also stuff, they have a thing called in that I believe they call it Code Blue. Don't quote me on that. That's the last I heard it was called. And it's when the temperatures drop to a certain point. Uh, they have churches and, and companies and buildings that have agreed that when the temperature drops below a certain point, they'll open their doors and allow the homeless to have a place to sleep. And so, and this, all of this started because somebody looked out and saw a need. They saw the homeless and they thought, what can I do to help? What can I do to maybe change somebody's life? And so they... <laughs> they came up with Sub Zero. And it's now a ministry that's touching a, a, a ton of lives, uh, homeless lives in, in Lake County. <laughs> There's also uh, a church in there that runs a, a daily uh, feeding for homeless, or for the, they don't call them, for the hungry is what they call it. And they, they help their, they have volunteers who come in. These are men and women who are getting involved and being involved and reaching out into the community to help those who have needs, those who might be in crisis. Now, one of the struggles and one of the things I hear <coughs> from, from my men's group is that, oh, but they're, it's their own fault. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. But that's not what we're called to. Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? We're just called to, to, to help those who are in crisis, those who are in need. We don't want to be like the Pharisees and look and walk the other way. We're called to go out and to be out there and to be touching. That's what matters. Uh, the rest of it's up to, to, to God to do the work and take care of. When we look out, we can have that happen. <coughs> Sorry. Um, oh, my. First, we're, we're not quite five yet. We're getting there very quickly. Uh, very quickly. And I've got it. So, thank you. She's listening. She's listening. You guys, I don't know. All right. <laughs> When our hearts are broken uh, for what breaks God's heart, we are open to find purpose in our life. And so, and now we get to verse 5 and 5 through 11. And 5 through 11 is Nehemiah's prayer. And, and what you have to hear here as, as, we, as we look at this prayer, we need to um, hear his heart, hear what's going on, hear his, his, what, he's, what he's crying out for. Verse 5. And so I'm running way short. I went long. So uh, verse five, it said, I said to the Lord, O, o Lord God uh, of heaven, uh, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. All right, right away in, in verse five, we see that, that Nehemiah um, it begins by saying, telling God how great he is. Uh, so, so here's this guy that, that has this burden on his heart, uh, and, he, and he begins this prayer by saying, God, you are, you are a great and mighty God, and you keep covenant with those who, who love you. He's reminding, he's reminding, I think he's reminding himself who God is, and I think he's telling God who he is. You know what? There is a, one of us in here that shouldn't start our prayers that way. Our prayers should all start with, God, you are a great and loving God. And we and we're and telling, reminding him of the promises. Not so not that he needs it, because I think when we remind him of the promises of his covenant love for the forest, that we remind ourselves of that. Now, I gotta give you a little background, and man, I'm probably out, I'm probably out of order, but I think I need to tell you this now. As Nehemiah is praying this prayer, um, there, there's this the fact is this: um, he knows, he knows. That what he's gonna he's, he's thinking about doing is, is not something he can do in and of his own power. You see, what, what it doesn't tell you here is Artaxerxes, which we find in chapter two is the king. Artaxerxes actually is the, the king who stopped, who stopped the building on the wall that had started earlier. All right, so and, and Nehemiah is about to have to go ask the same king who put a put his seal on it and said, no more work on, on, on that area. You're done. He has to go ask 
Artaxerxes to, for the permission to, to do what he's thinking about doing. And so when, when Nehemiah comes to this prayer, he's, he's spending several days in weeping and mourning, and he knows these facts, he's, he's present for them, and, and he's going to ask to do something that there's no way in and of Nehemiah's own power he can do. Guys, if I'm way off now, if if our purpose, if, if what we're called to do isn't greater than what we, we can do in and of our own power, if it's not greater than what we, we have the ability to do, then are we really doing what God calls us to do? If all I need is me to do what I, what, what I think I'm called to do, if I can handle it on my own, if you can handle it on your own, you're looking for a pastor, don't settle. That's not in my notes. Don't settle. Make sure you find the guy that he's called here because he's going to take you out and you're going to touch the world. You're going to look out and you're going to do that. If our call, if, if what we think we're supposed to be doing isn't greater than what we can do in and of ourselves, then maybe we need to relook at what we're doing. And I, and I believe that's here in Nehemiah. And Nehemiah realizes it. And as you hear his prayer, you're going to hear some of that some of that desperation, if you will, that, that's a good word for it. Our prayers over our calling should be desperate. We need God to, 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 to make it happen. And that's what Nehemiah is getting at here. So let's keep moving. Verse 6, listen to my prayer. Look down and see, the pray, uh, see me pray day and night for your people Israel. I, I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. Guys, God wants to work through us and he wants to use us. And we need to understand that we are fallen people. And he knows it. And he still calls us. He still wants to use us. He still loves us. And Nehemiah confesses the sins of the people. He confesses his own and his own family's sin. We need to be in that same realm when we're reaching out, when we're going and we're looking out and we're going to do things. When we're moving forward, we can't hide our sin from God. We just need to be upfront and open about it. And he goes on. We need to be doing that. We go on. Verse seven. Verse seven. I, I'm sorry, I got it. I, I found it, so I'll, I'll give you a break. We have we have sinned uh, terribly by by no not I'm sorry by not obeying the command commands, uh, decrees, and re religion religions. I'm sorry, regulations that that you uh, gave through your your servant Moses. Um, there are things that we should be doing. There are things that we, we should be following. And do you remember what Jesus said the greatest commandment was? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's be honest. We need to confess this quite often. Oh, wait, let, me, let me rephrase that. I need to confess. And if you're like me, you need to confess. I don't always love my neighbor as myself. I quite often am stuck on me and worried about me way more than I worry about those who are hurting and in need for whatever reason. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah reminds us here that we've blown it. And that's part of what we need to confess. Um, and then he goes on in verse 8. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are... Uh, Un, if, if you are sorry, if you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. Um, and, and folks, if, if we're struggling, if we're struggling in our own spiritual lives, if, if we feel like we have we have been separated and, and scattered and, and pushed aside, if our churches are struggling, if we're not seeing joy and and love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self, uh, faithfulness, and self-control. If we're not seeing the fruits of the Spirit growing in our churches, if we're not seeing those things, maybe it's because 
We haven't been faithful. We're not seeing the church pews fill. Maybe, maybe it's because we need to do what Nehemiah did here and, and to confess and, 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 and move on. And Nehemiah here is saying, God, you did. God, God remember, you did. And, and we want to serve. And we need to remember, God, you called us here. God, you put us in this body. And we want to serve you. We want to do what you're asking us to do. And then we get to verse 11. Oh, Lord, please, please hear my prayer. Listen, listen to the prayer of those of us who uh, delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it in his head to be kind to me. Grant success. <laughs> I, heard, I heard this morning uh, one, of the, one of the prayer requests was praying for the, the uh, pastor search committee. Pray for success for them. We, we, we need to be praying for success in every endeavor that we do. God, we, we can't do this on our own. God, there's no way we're going to find a pastor to fill this pulpit, to love us and to be our shepherd without your hand involved, hand involved, without you granting us this. I told you that Nehemiah knew he was going up. He was going to go ask the king who had said no more work that he could leave and go do work on the wall. The very thing that the king had stopped, he's now asking him to begin again. And here is Nehemiah's request. Make it so that the king is kind to me. Now we know the story, and I'm not going to go through all of chapter 2, <laughs> but here's the deal. Nehemiah gets his request answered. God blesses him abundantly, and he ends up getting everything he needs and the papers to go, and he goes and he builds the wall. And we know that we know the end of the story because we I hope you read it. And so, but here we see that when he's beginning, when he's finding his calling, when he's looked out and he's seen the struggle and he knows what he's supposed to do, we see here that he goes to God and says, It's beyond me, it's beyond my capabilities. I need you. That would be that, that's the Randy, the Randy version of what, what this prayer says. God, you are a great God. I know I've blown it. I know I'm sinful. I know I fail. Uh, and, and yet, Lord, please, please use me now. Bless me and make it so that we, I can accomplish what needs done. Nehemiah asked to ask for success. Um, Henry Blackaby writes this. Uh, he's a, a, a famous author and pastor, and, and you, you may know him, may not. Um, he writes this. He says, right now, God is working all around you. Whether you see him at work is irrelevant to, 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 um, irrelevant to the fact that God's presence in our world, is in our world. He is actively and uh, intimately involved in, in both the, the affairs of, the, of this world and the, the um, details of your life. In other words, Henry Blackaby is saying, whether you see it or not, God is all around us working. He is, he is out there doing things in the world. He wants the world. He loves the world. He, he, he loves the people in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves the people that are out there and he wants them to come to him. And he's already actively working and he's calling us to be involved in that work. And he's actively involved. He's wanting to be actively involved in our life. Nehemiah could have just simply put his head down when he saw the people coming. Hey, good to see you, brother. And gone about his business. He had work to do. Hey, good to see you. I gotta go do my laundry. Hey, I, hey, good to see you. I gotta go take care of it. But he, he was open and he looked out to what was happening. And he said, God, what is this you want me to do? He looks at it, and, and that's what we're seeing here. He finds his purpose, he finds his calling, 
because he's open and he's looking out. Um, sorry, not working yet. <laughs> here's, here's the deal. The very end of the, the, that verse 11, I didn't read it. I stopped, I stopped before, we, before we got there. At the very end um, of that, uh, Nehemiah says, in those days, I was the king's cupbearer. Now, I don't know what you guys know about cupbearers. Uh, cupbearers are the ones that tasted the wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. All right? So, yep. So, and, and Nehemiah didn't have a, 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 a stress-free job, right? <laughs> but, but and, and we find out later that he never was upset about it. He was always joyous before the, before the king. But here's the deal. Uh, I think Nehemiah makes this point. Remember, he's telling us a story. He's written this. And so I think he makes the point of telling us he's the cupbearer because he wants us to understand or, or, or he wants his people to understand that no matter what our role is in life, no matter where you're at, if you're willing to follow, to look out and then follow God and doing what he's asking you to do, whether it's, whether it's fixing shoes or starting a, a ministry for, for those homeless that need clothing or, or whether it's a, a soup kitchen or whether it's, or whether it's going into reading to your schools, whatever it is that God has called you to do in this world, if you're willing to follow him, number one, it's not going to be convenient. Number two, it's it, it, it's it's not going to be uh, it's it's not going to be something you can shouldn't be something you can do in and of your own power. And number three, it's going to change you. You ready for that? It's going to change who you are. Nehemiah was the cupbearer, and, and and by the end of the book of Nehemiah, we see that he's become an architect, an engineer, a planner, a leader. Uh, he, he actually put his hand to the wall, so he. He was a construction worker. Um, he, 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 helps, uh, he helps out the, the, the people who would be. He, there, there's so many things that he becomes because he's willing to look out, to look out and follow, to do what God is asking to do. We can't look at something and say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just a newspaper worker. Oh, I'm just a student in high school. Oh, I'm just a camp director. Oh, I'm retired. Nehemiah says, I'm a cupbearer. I was a cupbearer. And by the time you end the story, you're going, whoa, if God can do that with a cupbearer, what can he do with us? Look out. Look out! That's the call of the, the whole thing. Look out! And see what's going on. Pray with me. Father God, you are, are truly an amazing God, a great God, a glorious God. And, and, and Lord, you know, you know that we have failed you in so many ways and we've sinned against you. And Lord, we just pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our eyes, that you would help us to, to see your hand, to see your, your leading. And Father, that you would pour out your grace upon us that, that we would be able and willing to follow you, to do and live out the purpose you have for us. Help us to look outward. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you for putting up with my fumbling.